what's going to happen to the euro. Uh, but uh, what I want to speak about tonight is what I call the human side of investing. And I've written a book, which uh, Vladimir has a copy, and uh, here it is. Not for sale tonight. But uh, it, it, it's called The Most Important Thing. And the reason it's called that is because I go to clients' offices and I say, well, the most important thing is not losing money. And then 10 minutes later, I say, the most important thing is uh, being contrary. And 10 minutes later, something else. And so this book is about all the things that, that I think are the most important thing in investing. And I, I sum them up under the heading, uh, the human side of investing. Um, and that's what I'm going to talk about tonight, the, uh, the book and the origins and inspirations. Um, <coughs> You know, I, I was very fortunate. I got a great uh, educational foundation for my career. I went to Wharton as an undergraduate in the early 60s, at a time when uh, investment theory had not been invest in invented yet. And uh, I, I actually took a course in security analysis and other nuts and bolts kinds of things. And, you know, uh, the education at that time consisted of, uh, you know, this is a picture of the New York Stock Exchange. This is a stock certificate. If you want to buy one of these, you go there, call your broker. You know, that kind of really uh, uh, nuts and bolts stuff, not very enlightened. And then I went from there to the University of Chicago for an MBA, uh, just at the time that finance theory was starting to be taught in the, in the mid to late 60s. And uh, of course, I learned about the efficient market hypothesis, the capital uh, uh, market line, random walk and, and things like that. And uh, so my first real, so anyway, so the point is, there, I think there's three legs that should, that belong under any investing stool. And one is uh, nuts and bolts, pragmatic, uh, quantitative uh, security analysis. The second is an understanding of investment theory. And I don't think that the theory, which says, for example, that you can't beat the market uh, and that all assets are priced right all the time to produce a fair risk-adjusted return, I don't think you can take that uh, at face value or swallow it whole. But I think it's very important to understand the principles and the takeaways to inform your pragmatic search for value. Uh, and then the third, I think, is what I call the human side of it. And uh, as Rabbi Vogel mentioned before, one of my favorite quotes is from Yogi Berra. I don't know if you know who he is, but he's a famous American baseball player who says all these things that seem silly as you think about them for a while, and then they get wise. And Yogi said uh, that there's, in theory, there's no difference between theory and practice, but in practice there is. And I think that's very important. And so the human side of investing is really about uh, the difference between theory and practice. Um, investing would be easy if there were no people involved. If, if, if people or if people were, as theory tells us, rational, objective, uh, and unemotional, then yes, perhaps assets would be priced right. Perhaps uh, the economy and the markets would kind of look like this rather than like this. Uh, but, you know, then people get involved and with their uh, emotions, their, their fears, uh, their uh, aspirations and their foibles, uh, then markets and, and economies take on great cyclicality. And we better hope uh, that the prices diverge from fair value all the time or else we don't have anything to do. So that's what the book is about and that's what I wanted to talk to you about tonight. And uh, first I'm going to talk to you about some of the um, inspirations for the book, and some of the inspirations for the important elements of, of my philosophy. Um, and the first was the final exam at University of Chicago. Thank you, sir. Uh, and the, the course in... Uh, I'll take it. It's okay. So there was a course in, in investing. Gene Fama and the other luminaries of finance taught very uh, 
theoretical uh, courses. And then there was one taught by a guy named Jim Laurie, uh, which was much more pragmatic, and which I got much more out of it. And it was so pragmatic that the, that the academics who derided it called it Laurie Stories. And it was very anecdotal, and they would have people like me come in to talk about uh, our experience. But the great thing was that in the final exam for the course, uh, it consisted pri primarily of one question, and that question was, how are you going to reconcile, when you get out of here, uh, the, the theory of investing uh, with practice? And to me, that was kind of an eye opener about the need to accomplish that, uh, that reconciliation. And a lot of what I've done uh, is, is to try to do that, because as I said, the theory cannot be swallowed whole, but neither should it be disregarded. And one of the chapters in the book, chapter two, says that, uh, that the most uh, important thing is understanding market efficiency and its limitations. I mean, if you, obviously, if you think that the market is efficient and all assets are priced right, then you might as well not get up in the morning and go to work. Uh, on the other hand, <clears throat> if you think that market, the concept of market efficiency is completely irrelevant and you disregard it, then you're really riding for a fall. Uh, because that means that every time that you find a, sec a security uh, where the price is different from what you think it should be, you'll, you'll assume that you're right. But I think it's very important to understand that because of the workings of the consensus, much of the time, the consensus will be wrong. And you'll be wrong. And so if, if there's a security where the price diverges from what you think it should be, what that means is you better have damn good reasons to think that you was right and not the consensus. And, uh, and so that, that final exam question to me was eye-opening. Uh, the second one I want to tell you about is one of my heroes, John Kenneth Galbraith, who, uh, who wrote a lot, who I was very privileged. He passed away about three years ago, and I was privileged to meet him about a year and a half before that. I spent a little time reviewing books for the LA Times, and I reviewed one of his last books. He wrote me a letter saying that, you know, that my, uh, my uh, review had, uh, had satisfied the criteria for a good review, uh, which means that it should be erudite and it should be positive. And, uh, he's, and then he said, and he said, so why don't you come see me? So of course I flew to Boston and met him in Cambridge. And, uh, and he wrote a, a great little book called uh, A Short History of Financial Euphoria. And the great thing is, as he, got, as he got older, as he got into his 80s and his 90s, his books got thinner. Uh, maybe he didn't have the energy or the time. But I like thin books. And, uh, and uh, I recommend that one to you. And it, except that it says some very unkind things about high yield bonds, uh, with which I take issue, because I've made a living in them for the last 32 years. But, but, it's, but his books say a lot of wise things. And one of the things he, he says, and I forget if he says it there or elsewhere, is that he says we have two kinds of forecasters, the ones who don't know, and the ones who don't know they don't know. And I think this is extremely important. And one of the cornerstones of my philosophy is that we can't usefully predict the macro. Now, I'm sure there are people here who take issue with that, and maybe some of you have done it for years and made money, but I haven't. And I don't know many people who have. And um, if that's true, then that's very important. Um, I don't, you know, a lot of people try to predict what the economy and the markets and interest rates and currencies are going to do. And I think it's very hard. Uh, first of all, uh, these are fairly efficient markets in information in the sense that most people have the same information. And obviously then to reach a superior conclusion, you have to do superior analysis. Um, and I say superior conclusion because it's very important to realize in the investment business that it's not enough to be right. If you hold a correct forecast, that will not necessarily make you money. You have to hold a correct forecast which diverges from the consensus. If you have the same forecast as the consensus, and the consensus is right, and 
and you're right, you won't make any money. Because the opportunities for profit come when the consensus in, which, embody, which is embodied in the price of the asset at a given point in time is different from you and you're the one who's right. That's how you make money, by holding non-consensus correct forecasts. But it's hard to hold a, 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 a forecast which is different from the consensus. And it's hard, if you do, to be right. Uh, and, uh, so, and, and then, of course, it's also, if you hold a non-consensus forecast, it, it's also hard to bet very heavily on it because uh, that your non-consensus position will make you uh, uncomfortable. And um, over the years, I, I, I haven't seen anybody who's been consistently more right than the consensus about the macro. You know, people throw out forecasts very glibly, and once in a while they get it right, and you know what they say about a stop clock and so forth, and then they say, look, I had it right. And nobody in, in the forecasting business ever keeps score. Nobody says, uh, you know, I got it right, and two of my last ten other forecasts were also correct. Uh, it's very, uh, and, and, and so everything's very anecdotal. But I think it's very, there's a chapter in the book which says, the most important thing is knowing what you don't know. And I think that if you want to be a successful investor and if you want to survive very long, then it's not only important to know what you know, but it's very important to know what you don't know and to respect that. And uh, I use it in the book, I use a lot of quotes and, and uh, I live a lot by other people's quotes because there's a lot of wisdom in them. And one is from uh, a guy named Amos Tversky, who is an Israeli behaviorist who taught at Stanford. And he said, it's frightening to realize that you don't know something, but even more frightening that the world is run by people who think they do. It's very deep. Uh, Mark Twain, the American humorist, said the same thing in another way. He said, it's not what you don't know that gets you killed. It's what you know for certain that just ain't true. And, you know, clearly, if you if you think you don't know something, you will respect your ignorance. You'll diversify. You'll hedge. You'll, uh, you know, you'll take uh, actions that reflect your ignorance. If you think you know, you will not diversify. You will not hedge. And if you know and you're wrong, you're really heading for trouble. So I think it's very, very important to know what you don't know. And in my opinion, that includes the fact that, that forecasts, macro forecasts, are very, very hard to profitably rely on. The next thing I want to discuss with you uh, is another uh, seminal event for me, which I discuss in the book, and that's when I read an article called The Loser's Game. And The Loser's Game was an article written by a guy named Charlie Ellis, who was a consultant and uh, a writer on investment topics. And I think he had, it, it ran in the, Financial Analyst Journal around 72 or 73. And uh, who here plays tennis? Okay, half. And uh, Charlie Ellis referenced another article called Winning the, Winning the Losers Game, I think it was called. And uh, it was written by a guy named Cy Ramo. There was an American company called TRW and the Thompson and Ramo were rich, so Cy Ramo was the R in TRW. And he wrote an article about tennis. And he said that if you watch, let's say, Wimbledon, how do you win at Wimbledon? The winner of the championship at Wimbledon is the guy who hits the most winners. You win in championship tennis by hitting winners. Shots that the other guy can't get to or can't return. And if you, you know, championship tennis players are so good, they're so skilled, they're so talented, they're so practiced, that, that they know that 99% of the time, if they do this with their arm, and this with their hand, and this with their foot, and this with their shoulder, they'll hit a good shot. So there's rather little which is, be, which is beyond their control. They can do it. They can do it. And so if you don't hit a tough shot, They'll kill your ball. You must hit a tough shot to, to 
not get killed and a winner to win. So championship tennis is played, is won by hitting winners. But for the people in the room who play tennis, assuming you're in my category, how do we win? We don't hit winners. We try to avoid hitting losers. Because at the club level, for amateur tennis players, tennis is a loser's game. The points in a in a amateur tennis match don't go most of the time to the guy who hits the winner. They go to the guy who doesn't hit the loser. And that's a big difference. So when I play tennis, kind of like I invest, I just try to keep the ball in play. And I know if I hit it back every time, eventually the other guy will hit it off the court or into the net, and I'll win. I don't have to hit a winner to win. And in fact, if I go for winners, they may well be outside my ability. And so going for a winner in amateur tennis may be the way to lose. Now, who, who, who here followed that? Okay, somebody got my uh, it's, it's, I hope I made it clear. But I think this is a very important distinction. And the reason that I can't go for winners is because I'm not good enough to hit them consistently. And I know that if I do this with my arm, and this with my hand, and this with my foot, and this with my shoulder, the ball could go there, there, or there. I'm just not that good. And I have to worry about bad bounces, and the sun, and the wind, and the funny spins. You know, the pros never think about those things. They're so good, they don't have to. So, the question is, for you, in thinking about your approach to, tent, to investing, this is what Charlie Ellis did in his article so well. He says, which do you want to, which kind of game do you want to play as an investor? Do you want to try to win by winning? Or do you want to try to win by not losing? And, you know, Oak Tree has a motto, if we avoid the losers, the winners take care of themselves. Now, the, the markets we're involved in, distressed debt and high yield bonds and private equity mezzanine finance. Uh, these are adventurous, uh, exciting, risk-bearing strategies. And we think that in these fields, the best way uh, to ensure long-term success and survival is more through the exclusion of losers than it is by executing winners. And about eight, no, four years ago, uh, there was a new, uh, an updated edition of Security Analysis published. And that was, uh, uh, Security Analysis was the Graham and Dodd uh, book. It was the Warren Buffett's Bible, and it's probably the best book ever written on Security Analysis. And it's probably still the Bible today, but, but a little out of date. So uh, there was a desire to publish an updated version, and I was asked to write a chapter on fixed interest. And um, so that means I had to go back and reread it in, let's say, 06 or 07. I hadn't read it since 64. And, um, but it was, it was interesting to reread it. And one of the things that, that Graham and Dodd said in the book is that fixed income investing is a negative art. Kind of in line with Charlie Ellis' Loser's Game. What does it mean to be a negative art? It, what, what, what Graham and Dodd meant was that if you think about it, anybody here in the fixed income business? A few, well, more than it used to be, okay? A bunch of retreaded equity investors. But if you think about it, if you buy a bunch of 8% bonds, the ones that pay will all produce an 8% return. So it doesn't matter which of the ones that pay you buy. But the difference is whether you buy the ones that don't pay. Because they may lose 10%, 30%, 50%, 70%. And so the measure of being a superior bond investor is not through the inclusion of ones that pay. It doesn't matter which ones you buy. But it's the exclusion of the ones that don't pay. So again, Graham and Dodd were saying, 1940, when the edition I read was written, that bond investing is a loser's game. And it's the same thing 
And, and so I thought that when I read Charlie's article back in the mid-70s, I thought it was really important and, and <coughs> stayed with me. Um, the next influence I want to talk about is uh, a book, a newer book, written about six or seven years ago by uh, Nicholas, Nassim Nicholas Taleb, who here has read uh, Full by Randomness. Okay, half. Um, this is an important book. I, I, I describe this book as either the most important poorly written book you'll ever read or the worst written important book you'll ever read. Uh, who agrees uh, with that assessment? It's really, it's quite poorly written. It's quite, uh, you know, what, what Taleb, I think, is trying to do is show that he's smarter than the reader. Uh, so he, he doesn't uh, simplify. Uh, and at times he, he uh, seems to go the other way. But anyway, what he says is, is that life is, there's a lot of randomness in life, and there's a particularly great amount of randomness in the investing business. And our influences, our, our, our results are greatly influenced by random events, which are beyond our control. Uh, and so, um, the point is, when, when there are, it's kind of like with the tennis players, when there are a lot of random events, what that means is that it's easy for people to be, quote, right, but lose. And it's easy to people, it's easy to make correct judgments that are unsuccessful, and it's easy to make incorrect judgments which are successful. Uh, and I think this is a very important realization. Uh, one of the thing, first things I learned when I, when I went to Wharton as a kid was that the quality of the decision cannot be ascertained from the outcome. This is a very, very important concept that you must understand. Uh, because in a world in which there are a lot of r r random influences, um, as I said before, correct decisions can produce losses. Correct in, an, in, a, in a theoretical sense. Incorrect uh, 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 judgments and decisions can produce gains. And, and, and the truth of the matter is that the investment business is full of people who are right for the wrong reason. I think we'll all agree on that. And full of people who are right, uh, who get famous for being right once in a row. You know, if you, if you do one thing which is right, and it's big enough, you get famous. Now, just making one correct decision should not be uh, the standard for canonization, but often it is. And when you add in the fact that randomness means that it can happen for the wrong reasons, then certainly, Nobody should be lionized uh, for being right once in a row, but, but often they are. But, you know, what, what Taleb is basically saying is that be aware that randomness plays a big part. So when you look at somebody's record, uh, you know, if they're right once or twice or they have a few good years, um, it, you know, it, it's very, it's a tendency in the investment business, of course, to follow the person who was the right, the most right lately. But you should only follow people who have been right for years, consistently. You know, I mean, in a world where, where random uh, influences are important, uh, it's, it's the word consistency that matters. Uh, think about it. I always say that, that for success, there are three ingredients. Uh, aggressiveness, timing, and skill. And if you have enough aggressiveness at the right time, you don't need much skill. You know, the point is that when markets do well, which is hard to remember, but most of the time markets do well. And when markets do well, it's easy to make money. And in fact, when markets do well, the highest returns generally go to the people who take the most risk. But, but risk-bearing itself is not a form of skill. Only intelligent risk-bearing is a form of skill. And what is the difference between risk-bearing and intelligent risk-bearing? And the answer is that the intelligent risk-bearer makes money in the good markets and doesn't give it back in the bad markets. And the pure risk-bearer adds no value, so all he does is make money in the up markets, give it back in the down markets. Chapter 19 says, that the most important thing is value-added investing, which is characterized by an asymmetry. A great investor is somebody who makes a lot of money in good markets and, may, and, and doesn't give it back in bad markets. And, and 
that's the great accomplishment. Uh, but if you, the the skill of the manager, skill of the investor, by definition, then can only be assessed in uh, environments which are hostile to his approach. The long investor, which most of us are, can only be assessed in down markets. And if, you have, if you're going through a period of up markets, you know, uh, it's never tested. This is why Buffett came out with the great line, I think, around January or February of 08. He said, it's only when the tide goes out that we can find out who's been swimming without a baby. It's only when markets turn tough that we find out which people who made a lot of money in the up markets made it through luck or aggressiveness or risk bearing and which ones made it through skill with the risks under control. So this is a very important uh, part of, of uh, Taleb's message. And uh, you know, to illustrate the role of randomness, he says, he points out the difference between investors and dentists. Any dentists here? No dentists. I found got something that there was no tool. But, you know, there's no randomness in dentistry. If you go to dental school, you learn how to fill a cavity, you can fill a cavity correctly every time. There's no wind, there's no sun, there's no, uh, you know, blow-ups of the euro, there's no failures of political leadership, uh, there are no exogenous uh, events. Uh, so, you know, but the point is, his point, and it's true, and this is another reason why you have to think about it, is that that's not a good description of, of investing. Uh, where, investing is an area where randomness plays a big part. And so, as an investor, I think, you have to be prepared for a lot of different environments. There's a professor here in London, at the L London Business School, named Elroy Gibson, who said, I think brilliantly, love, risk means more things can happen than will happen. Very simple sounding uh, formulation, which I think is very significant. Um, everything you think about for the future is governed by a, a, a distribution of possibilities. And many things can happen, only one will happen. And, you know, so making a prediction of the one is probably a dangerous way to run your life. Getting a feel for the shape of the distribution and which is most likely and how likely it is and what traps are lying in, in the tails and how likely they are, that's really the key. But if life is a probability distribution, then clearly you're not going to be able to predict the outcome all the time. And that people who get it right can get it through luck and people who make good quote, good decisions can get it wrong, this is very, very educational. And so I would highly encourage you to read Fooled by Randomness.